All right, moving along with our study of continued fractions, we're ready to begin discussing infinite length continued fractions. So, a formal definition of what real numbers are is way beyond what I want to get into. In fact, I'd say a solid majority of undergraduate math majors never actually formally define what the real numbers are. I certainly didn't, not as an undergrad or as a grad student. I just kind of had to read about it one day on my own. So we're only going to use basic arithmetic properties anyway. You know, how do you add numbers? What number is bigger than another, etc. Plus some results on convergence of sequences and series of real numbers. So the natural numbers, integers, rational numbers can all be embedded as subsets of the real numbers. This is all pretty familiar to most of us. So suppose you have a real number. Every integer is either larger than x or less than or equal to it. So the integers can be expressed as those less than or equal to x union those larger than x. And the two sets are disjoint. There can be no integer which is in both sets. The first is bounded above by x and the second is bounded below by x. So by the well ordering principle, there is a largest integer less than or equal to x and a smallest integer bigger than it. And they have to differ by exactly one. So in other words, for any real number x, there is a unique choice of n, an integer, so that n is less than or equal to x is strictly less than n plus one. No big surprise. We're gonna call that the integer part of x, denoting it as square brackets around x. It's also, by the way, called the floor of x, where the notation looks similar, but is slightly different. Uh, the floor notation tends to be used more in computer science. The integer part is kind of legacy notation in, in number theory and mathematics, but it's what I'm used to. So this notation is consistent with the division algorithm, which is why we still use it. The quotient a over b from the division algorithm is the integer part of the rational number a over b. We discussed that in the previous video. The fractional part of x is then the difference between the two, just as it was before. Since the integer part satisfies n is less than or equal to x is less than n plus 1, x minus the integer part must be strictly between 0 and 1, possibly equal to it if x was already equal to an integer to begin with. Okay, so we're going to do a pretty familiar procedure. We generated continued fraction expansions of rational numbers by taking quotients, then reciprocating remainders and repeating until eventually we had a remainder of 0 and stopped. We're going to do the same thing for real numbers using integer parts in place of quotients. So for a real number x, define a0 to be its integer part and c0 to be its fractional part. In other words, x is its integer part plus its fractional part, and its fractional part is between 0 and 1. If that fractional part is 0, stop. Otherwise, 1 over it is bigger than 1, and then we can take its integer part and fractional part, call that a1 and c1, and sort of keep going. If you end up with a remainder of 0, stop. Otherwise, because this new uh, fractional part is between 0 and 1, 1 over it is larger than 1, and you just keep going. So this is marginally expanded notation now. We defined these brackets around a0 through a n, where a0 is an arbitrary integer and the rest are positive integers. If we allow arbitrary real numbers in here, we can define notation in the same way. Specifically, a0 through a n is a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 all the way out to 1 over a n. In which case, since I can write x is equal to its integer part plus its fractional part, or a0 plus c, we could just write a0 plus c, plus no other fractional parts, no other 1 overs. But suppose c0 isn't 0, then I could write this right here. In which case, we would have x is equal to a0 plus 1 over a1 plus c1. So I can write that using our continued fraction notation as a0 plus 1 over this. That's exactly what we have. So we're just allowing our existing notation to have non-integer values in here. And then you could keep going. Okay, so x is actually equal to a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 plus this remainder c2. Okay, so if you keep going and you ever get a zero remainder, we have a standard continued fraction expansion of a rational number. It terminated. Otherwise, the continued fraction expansion matches all of our terms except for the very last one. Okay, we keep generating an arbitrary integer and then positive integers except this last term which has this remainder bit added on and therefore isn't an integer. So we have the following algorithm. Okay, so start somewhere and pick a real number. Just define our starting index to be zero and call that x being x naught. Make an integer part, call that a, take the remainder or fractional part, call it c, 
output that partial quotient. If that remainder was zero, then you're done. Otherwise, move to the next index, reciprocate, and try again. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna continue outputting partial quotients until possibly the remainder is zero and it stops. Now, this will only terminate if the number is rational, in which case it produces a continued fraction expansion that represents that rational number x. So we've already observed that rational numbers, this will terminate. The algorithm, however, only terminates when the remainder is zero, meaning at a certain point, you actually had a naught plus one over a one plus one over dot 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 plus one over a i plus c i. But if this is zero, then we just have a nice finite expansion here and this is a rational number. So rational numbers are the only way this can stop. The only way you'll ever get a zero remainder is if you started with a rational number. Okay, so what if you don't have a rational number and this algorithm never terminates? So it produces an infinite sequence of partial quotients. The first term is an arbitrary integer, but after that we had reciprocals of things that were positive, so we end up with non-negative integers, positive ones in fact, because we never have a zero. So with rational numbers, we continue to refer to these as partial quotients of x, it just never stops. So can we actually write something like putting an ellipsis here? This is now an infinite sequence of numbers, but what does this even mean to have some sort of a naught plus one over a one plus one over a two plus and so forth? If we can write it down, how do we compute it and what does it represent and how does it actually represent the number x that we started with? Okay, suppose you have an irrational x, so it generated an infinite list of partial quotients, a naught, semicolon, a one comma a two and etc. and it never stops. Now for finite continued fractions, we know we can compute the value of the corresponding rational number to a list of convergence, which were defined through this recursive formula. Here's our starting values. P naught is A naught, Q naught is one, P naught is A naught A one plus one, Q one is A one. And then after that point, we have the same recursive formula for both. The next P or Q is a partial quotient times the previous P or Q plus the one before that. So for an infinite continued fraction, we're going to generate convergence in exactly the same way. We just get an infinite sequence of them. We will show that the sequence of convergence is aptly named, they converge to x. So the proof does take some time, it will require several steps, so, you know, take a breath and get ready. All right, let's take a look at our convergence. The first thing we're going to show is that the denominators of the convergence, the qn, are strictly increasing. q0 is less than q1 is less than q2. However, there is a single possible exception that possibly q0 equals q1. Otherwise, they're strictly increasing. So as a first step, we'll first show they're all at least positive. So q0 is defined to be 1. That's certainly positive. q1 is defined to be a1, which is a positive integer. Now let's assume that all the denominators qi up to some index n are positive. Well then, the next denominator is a positive integer times the previous plus the previous denominator, and we just assume those are positive. So overall, they are all positive. Okay, all of the denominators qn are positive. That's nice, but not quite what we were trying to prove. However, we have already shown that q0 is less than or equal to q1. q0 was defined to be 1. q1 is defined to be a1. It's a positive integer. It's bigger than or equal to 1. So Q naught is bigger than or equal to Q1, but past that point, if we start using our recursive definition to compute our denominators, Qn plus one is An plus one, which is a positive integer, it's bigger than or equal to one, times Qn plus Qn minus one. Qn minus one is a positive number, so this is bigger than Qn. So Qn plus one is bigger than Qn, with the possible exception that Q naught equals Q1. Okay, we can say a little bit more. The denominators, in fact, are getting big exponentially fast at least. Specifically, the denominator qn is at least as large as the n plus first Fibonacci number. Now the Fibonacci numbers are defined recursively by f0 equals 0, f1 equals 1, and then you get the next Fibonacci number by adding the two before it. So q0 equals f1. q0 is 1, which is f1. Q1 is A1, which is bigger than or equal to 1, which is the second Fibonacci number. Now let's inductively assume that the denominators QI are bigger than or equal to the Fibonacci number FI plus 1 up to a certain point. Well then, the next denominator is computed as a positive integer times QN plus QN minus 1. 
this positive integer is bigger than or equal to one. We just assumed this is bigger than or equal to the Fibonacci number fn plus one, and this is bigger than or equal to the Fibonacci number fn. But the sum of these two, by definition, is the next Fibonacci number fn plus two. So a quick inductive proof that the denominators are at least as large as the Fibonacci sequence, and it's known that the Fibonacci sequence grows exponentially fast, like the golden ratio to the nth power. So the denominators of any continued fraction expansion grow at least exponentially fast, possibly faster. Okay, so the denominators qn are strictly increasing. What about the convergence themselves? Not quite, but close. If n is even, then the next convergent is bigger, but if n is odd, then the next convergent is smaller. So we've already proved this equality right here. Specifically, we proved that pn plus 1 times qn minus pn times qn minus 1 is negative 1 to the power, which is the smaller index on, on the p's. So this works out to be just like that. So if n is even, we end up with a positive number on the right, negative 1 to an even power. In other words, pn plus 1 is larger. But if n is odd, then we end up with a negative number, meaning pn plus 1 is smaller. Next, suppose n is even. Well then, we know how the next convergent looks, but what if I go two steps forward? So this theorem says, from one even convergent to the next even convergent is bigger, while from one odd indexed convergent to the next odd indexed convergent is smaller. So let's suppose n is even. Well then, we want to establish this right here. So we want this difference to be positive. So let's start computing this difference. The first thing we do is we introduce a minus pn plus one over qn plus one and a plus pn plus one over qn plus one. Now this right here we know is negative one to the n plus one, negative one to the index on the smaller, uh, to the smaller index. And this right here is negative one to the n, but we assumed n is even. So this numerator is plus one and this numerator will be minus one. Okay, we're also going to factor a qn plus one out. So this, we factored the qn plus one out, this numerator was plus one and this numerator was minus one, but the qn's are strictly increasing. So q, one over qn is bigger than one over qn plus two because qn plus two is a bigger denominator. So we have a positive number times another positive number. Overall, this is positive. And if this difference here is positive, well then this inequality holds. When n is odd, the proof is very, very similar. It's just we have a different direction of an inequality and that comes from changing which of our negative ones raised to a power are positive and which are negative. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of proofs, by the way, where something being even versus odd the only thing that really changes is the reversal of a bunch of inequalities, but the technique of proof is the same. We're never going to prove it twice. We're just going to take one of them and prove it. Okay, so let's look at the sequence of convergence Pn over Qn. If you only looked at the even index terms, we established those are strictly increasing, but we also established that the odd index terms are strictly decreasing. However, each even index term is less than the next odd index term, and each odd index term is larger than the next even index term. So here's the big theorem. The sequence of convergence actually converges to some real number. So if we take the four statements above and incorporate them, we end up with the following string of inequalities. The even index convergence are getting bigger, the odd indexed convergence are getting smaller. However, moving from an even index to an odd index makes us smaller. So this gets smaller when I go to P2, but now I get bigger when I go to P3, and now I get smaller when I go to P4, and bigger when I go to P5, etc., etc. So let's observe how this all fits together. Okay, so P4 over Q4 is bigger than P2 over Q2 and so forth. What about in the other direction? So all of these even index terms are always smaller than the next even index term, but those are also smaller than the next odd indexed term in this list, which are decreasing. So any particular even index term 
is less than the next odd index term, and then those decrease, which are bigger than the next even index, which are smaller than the next odd index. So this is smaller than this, is bigger than that, which is still bigger than that, is smaller than this, which is less than this, is bigger than that, which is bigger than that, is less than this, which is less than that, and so forth. So we have this even index terms increasing, odd index terms decreasing, but they're also bounding each other. The even index terms are increasing, but never surpass the value of any odd index term, and those are decreasing, but never get less than any even index term. So the even index terms are strictly increasing, but bounded above by any of the particular odd index terms. And there's a foundational theorem in real analysis, any strictly increasing bounded sequence has a limit. So the even index terms have a limit, but similarly, the odd index terms are decreasing and bounded below, so the odd index terms have a limit as well. We don't know they're the same limit, they just, the even index terms converge to something and the odd index terms converge to something. But the difference between two consecutive terms is one over qn times qn plus one. We know that qn's are getting bigger and bigger, meaning this difference is converging to zero. So even index converges to one number, odd index converges to another, but the difference between two consecutive terms is converging to zero. So these limits cannot be apart from one another. Meaning LE equals LO. The even index terms are converging to some number. The odd index terms are converging to some number. That accounts for everything in your sequence, even index or odd index. So overall, the sequence converges to some number. All right, we'll start with a little result that we'll expand upon in a minute. Suppose we have an infinite continued fraction. The convergence converge to a real number and the even index terms are less than that number and the odd index terms are bigger than it. We've already addressed convergence, but remember how we did it. We had this string of inequalities that the even index terms are increasing, but bounded above by the odd index terms, which are decreasing and bounded below by the even, et cetera, et cetera. So the limit is approached from below by the even index terms and from above by the odd index terms, which is really all we're saying in this little theorem here. Whatever the limit is, it's in between the even index and odd index terms. So a slightly bigger result, very similar to the previous one. Suppose you have an irrational number and you run it through our algorithm and you generate an infinite list of partial quotients. Let's let PN over QN be the convergence of that infinite continued fraction that was generated. Then the PN over QN don't just converge, they in fact converge to X. So remember, we've already established that X is flat out equal to this finite continued fraction where that last term has a remainder. And since X is irrational, the remainder is never zero, but it's actually positive, it's between zero and one. So let's actually compute a few of these. X is A naught plus a remainder. That's A naught plus something, that's bigger than A naught. But A naught over one is exactly P naught over Q naught. So X is bigger than P naught over Q naught. But X is also A naught semicolon A one plus C one. That's A naught plus one over. So now what we have is we have A one plus a number. So this number is bigger than A one. So when I reciprocate it, it's less than one over A one, but that's exactly this continued fraction, which would give us P one over Q one. So X was bigger than P naught over Q naught, but X is now lesser than P one over Q one. Well, what about the next term? X is flat out equal to A naught plus one over A1, plus one over A2, plus the remainder C2. Okay, this is between zero and one, so this is bigger than A2, so this is less than one over A2, so this is bigger than one over A1 plus one over A2. But that's just this continued fraction, that's P2 over Q2. So X was bigger than this convergent, but less than this one, but bigger than this one. If you keep going, However far deep in the continued fraction you bury this remainder, you just reciprocate a certain number of times and you keep flipping the inequality back and forth. So what we've proven is that the even index terms are less than X, but the odd index terms are bigger. And the even index terms and the odd index terms are converging to the same thing, which means whatever they're converging to by the squeeze law is exactly X. So not only does an irrational number generate an infinite continued fraction, and not only does an infinite continued fraction generate convergence, which converge to something, they actually converge to the X you started with. Okay, so irrational numbers 
generate continued fraction expansions whose convergence converge to x. Any infinite continued fraction must converge to something. So is it possible that there might be two different continued fraction expansions converging to the same thing? No. Suppose I have two different infinite continued fraction expansions with convergence pn over qn and pn prime over qn prime respectively. If any of the partial quotients are different, then the sequences have different limits. So first, just remark that pn over qn is a0 plus the finite expansion that ignores that integer part. So if the pn over qn are converging to some limit, and I've just denoted this as limit sub a because pn over qn were the convergence for the partial quotients that were a sub i. So this is limit sub a. Well then, if these are converging to l sub a, then just these by themselves are converging to that same number minus a naught. And if the pn prime over qn prime are converging to some limit, which I'll denote limit sub b, well then ignoring the integer part must be converging to lb minus b naught. So we've already shown that for these sequences here that have zero integer parts, the limits have to be strictly between zero and one. What we showed is that if this integer part is zero, these finite continued fractions are all between zero and one. So their limit must be as well, and the limit cannot be a rational number because a rational number would have a finite continued fraction expansion. So the limit is strictly between zero and one. So whatever LA minus A naught is and whatever LB minus B naught is, they're both strictly between zero and one. It therefore follows that the difference between them is between plus or minus one. LA minus A naught and LB minus B naught are between zero and one. So at most their difference could be uh, uh, something very close to one minus something very close to zero or something very close to zero minus something very close to one. So something in between plus or minus one. If they have the same limit, if LA equals LB, which by the way, <clears throat> uh, would be an assumption to the contrary of this theorem, we're trying to prove they have different limits. Suppose they have the same limit. Well then, B naught minus A naught has to belong to minus one, one, because this right here would be zero, meaning this right here has to be between plus or minus one. But this is a difference of two integers. A naught and B naught have to be integers. The difference of two integers has to be an integer, so the only integer in this interval is exactly zero. So if the two continued fractions converge to the same thing, if the limits are the same, then A naught has to equal B naught, meaning if A naught isn't equal to B naught, the limits have to be different. All right, so what we want to show is that if two infinite continued fractions with their associated convergence ever differ in any partial quotient, then what they're converging to can't be the same number. What we've shown is that if the first partial quotient, a0 and b0, if those aren't the same, the limits have to be different. So let's suppose a0 is equal to b0, but there is some index where they differ. Well, if they differ in some indices, then they differ at a first index. So let n be the last index at which they've all been the same up to that point. This n is either even or odd. As I've mentioned, we are just going to prove one case. Let's assume n is even. Okay, so let's assume without loss of generality that the next partial quotient, which was the first index where they are different, that the a happens to be the one where it's bigger. So a n plus one is strictly bigger than b n plus one. Assuming n is even tells us that the even index convergence for our a terms are increasing, but they are bounded above by any particular odd index term. But similarly, the partial quotients for our b terms, since n is even, this is increasing to that, but not bigger than this odd index term. Okay, let's let l sub a be the limit of pn over qn, l sub b be the limit of pn prime over qn prime, as we had on the previous slide. So it follows from the above. Remember that whatever the limit is, it's trapped between two consecutive terms. So this limit has to be less than this rational number, but this limit has to be bigger than this one. So if we can simply establish that this number here is less than or equal to this one, then LA is less than this, is less than or equal to that, is less than LB, it will prove that LA and LB cannot be equal to one another. That if there was ever an index at which the partial quotients were different, whatever these two are converging to can't be the same number, which was our goal. So our goal now is to establish that under the assumption that AN plus one is bigger than BN plus one, that PN plus one over QN plus one is less than or equal to P prime N plus two over Q prime N plus two.
Okay, so in our goal to show that if these two continued fraction expansions are ever different, then the limits have to be different. And what we did is we assumed all of the partial quotients are the same up to a certain point. At the next index, the a's are bigger. And what we want to show is this inequality here, that will complete the proof. Okay, now this inequality can be rephrased just by multiplying across our denominators and collecting everything on one side. Now we're just gonna start using the recursive definitions of how we compute successive p's and q's. This pn plus one is computed here. Q prime n plus two uses the partial quotients with b's rather than a's. P prime uses partial quotients b's, q's use partial quotient a's. Okay, <clears throat> but remember all of the partial quotients were the same up to index n, meaning if you're computing p's and q's up to but not beyond index n, they'll be the same. So the prime doesn't matter as long as your index is n or smaller. So we can take this qn prime and this pn prime and simply replace them with qn and pn. Now we do the same thing again. This q prime n plus one, I use the recursive definition and substitute this, similarly p prime n plus one. The point of doing this is that now we have q prime n, q prime n minus one, p prime n, p prime n minus one. Those are still just using partial quotients up to and not beyond where they were all the same and the prime is not relevant. So all of this recursive substitution, the goal was just to get rid of all the primes. Because now I just have p's and q's, if we simply distribute everything out, doing a bunch of tedious but not difficult algebra, there are a bunch of terms that cancel out, and what is left behind is this enormous mess. But now, as commonly happens when doing this algebraic you know, fiasco, after doing a bunch of distribution and canceling some stuff out, now you start refactoring. So it factors like this, okay? If you really doubt the algebra, just pause the video and check. But <clears throat> notice that this term, pn qn minus one minus pn minus one qn is just the opposite of this one, pn minus one qn minus pn qn minus one. So we can factor that out as this minus that. But what do we have right here? We have a P and a Q kind of difference where we change the index by one and balance them against one another. We know that's exactly a power of negative one. Specifically, it's negative one to the N plus one. And we assumed that N was even, meaning that's an odd power of minus one. So this exactly is equal to BN plus one, BN plus two plus one minus AN plus one, BN plus two. Okay, so our goal, remember, was just to establish this inequality right here, and we computed that this quantity is exactly this. And we still have this assumption that we haven't yet used, that an plus 1 is strictly bigger than bn plus 1. Well, if it's strictly bigger than bn plus 1, then bn plus 1 minus an plus 1 is negative. So what do we have? We have bn plus 2 times a negative integer plus 1. So since this is a negative integer and it's negative, it's at least as low as minus one. So what we have is overall this whole thing computed down to be less than or equal to negative bn plus two plus one. But now bn plus two is some integer, which means this is less than or equal to zero. Completing the proof. If two continued fraction expansions ever differ at any single partial quotient, two infinite continued fraction expansions. I should clarify, if you think back to the rational continued fraction video, there was a little hiccup there. But if two infinite continued fraction expansions ever differ, then their limits cannot be equal. The difference with rational numbers, remember, is that it was allowed to be different in the last index. Infinite continued fractions do not have a last index. Okay, and this is the proof for when n is even, but we're not gonna do it all over again. All right, next is a theorem that's gonna look dumb, but it's not. Suppose x is continued fraction a naught plus one over a one plus one over a two and so forth. And let's suppose a naught is a positive integer so that we can do this. We can say b plus one over a naught plus one over a one and so forth then that's just b plus 1 over x. Now this might look very straightforward. It might look like all we have to do is say that y is equal to 
b plus 1 over a0 plus 1 over a1 and so forth, but this right here is exactly x. But we can't quite do that, and here's why. How do we define continued fractions like this to converge as a limit of a sequence of convergence? This involved me doing an, arithmet an arithmetic substitution on something with an ellipsis. That's always really dicey. Whenever you're trying to do a just sort of cavalier manipulation of something with an ellipsis involved, there's a limit that you're brushing under the rug. So what we're really going to do is we're going to work through the convergence of these two continued fractions and show that we get this equality right here. That will show that the pen mark arithmetic that I want to do that's so fast and easy is actually legitimate. Okay, so let's let pn over qn and pn prime over qn prime be the convergence of x and y respectively. So pn over qn is this finite continued fraction. What about pn prime over qn prime? So it's going to go out to the nth index here, but notice that this starts here at a0, a1, so the nth index is actually a n minus 1. But this is now a finite length continued fraction. We can manipulate this with familiar rules of arithmetic. This is exactly pn minus 1 over qn minus 1. So what we end up with is that pn prime over qn prime is simply b plus qn minus 1 over pn minus 1. Now the pn minus 1s over qn minus 1s converge to x, therefore their reciprocals converge to 1 over x. So pn prime over qn prime does converge to b plus 1 over x as we desired. Ooh, so a few concluding remarks. What we've established and was really the key so far, every irrational x generates an infinite list of partial quotients. That list of partial quotients generates a sequence of convergence and those convergence converge back to x. Also, that is the only infinite list of, of uh, partial quotients whose convergence will converge to x. So there is a nice one-to-one -one correspondence between irrational x's and infinite continued fractions. Now let's suppose we have a sequence of convergence, pn over qn, and they are converging to x. What can we say about the distance from x to its convergent? We already know the limit of this will be zero. That's just because the pn over qns are converging to x. But how closely can we approximate the irrational number x with the rational and fairly easy to compute convergent pn over qn? The fact that the pn over qn's are recursively defined also says if I've computed a few of them, it's not that much work to compute one more, and then it's not much work to compute one more, and I get better and better approximations. But if we can somehow control or stay, say very specific things about how close this convergent is, this rational number that is therefore easy to do arithmetic with and easy to compute based on the continued fraction expansion, how close is it to the irrational number x that I may be actually interested in running computations with, like, I don't know, pi, e, the square root of 2, these irrational numbers that we may want to perform computations with but are very difficult to attack directly. Can we approximate them really well with rational numbers? And historically, that's why continued fractions were such a big deal. So the topic of how well numbers can be approximated by their convergence is a big topic. Uh, I'm underselling it by saying it's reserved for the next lecture. It's actually going to take several videos to get through. What we're going to conclude with right now is a few explicit examples of computing convergence of continued fractions and therefore what their limits are. So here's a first example. We have a continued fraction where every partial quotient is 2. Okay, it's an infinite continued fraction. The convergence have to converge to something. What do they converge to? What's the value of x? Well, whatever the value of x is, it satisfies that x is 2 plus 1 over x. This little arithmetic trick that this is 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over etc. So it's 2 plus 1 over x. We proved the whole theorem that this was valid. And it is. So x is equal to 2 plus 1 over x. Distributing out, moving stuff over, etc. We get x squared minus 2x minus 1 is 0. The quadratic formula is a thing. So x is 1 plus or minus the square root of 2. However, the convergence of x, the pn over qn, will all be positive. So whatever x is, their limit, it cannot be negative. So it is not 1 minus root 2, it's 1 plus root 2. So here is the continued fraction expansion of the irrational number 1 plus the square root of 2. As our second example, compute the continued fraction expansion of the irrational number root 5 plus 1 over 2. This is the golden ratio. So first, let's compute 
its integer part? Well, the square root of five is bigger than two, but it's less than three. So root five plus one over two is in between three halves and four halves. So its integer part is one. Then x is equal to one plus x minus one, which is one plus one over one over x minus one. But the value of x was specifically chosen that it's the unique positive solution to the equation one over x minus one equals x. This is sort of geometrically where the golden mean is defined through is this, this ratio being true. You can also simply check that if you start off with the equation one over x minus one equals x, there will be two solutions, one positive, one negative. The positive one is exactly this value of x, meaning one over x minus one here is simply equal to x. So x is equal to one plus one over x. So x has an integer part one, and then I have an x down there as the denominator. So x is equal to one plus one over x, but x is equal to one plus one over x, and so forth and so forth and so forth. All of the partial quotients will be one. Okay, so the golden mean root five plus one over two has continued fraction expansion where every partial quotient is one. Our third and final example, compute Pn over Qn up to a certain point, so for n equals zero, one, two, three, and four, for the continued fraction expansion where a sub i equals i. So it's zero is its integer part, but then the partial quotients are one, two, three, four, and so forth. Okay, so we're just gonna compute these by hand. P naught over Q naught is a naught over one, that's zero over one. P one over Qn by definition is a naught a one plus one over a one, or if you plug in the value of a naught and a one, you get one over one. Now we can start using our recursive definition. P two over Q two, well, P2 is A2 P1 plus P0, Q2 is A2 Q1 plus Q0. We've computed P0 to be 0, Q0 to be 1, P1 to be 1, Q1 to be 1, and A2 is 2. Remember, every AI is simply equal to I itself. Plug those in, you get 2 thirds. P3 over Q3 is 3 times 2 plus 1 over 3 times 3 plus 1. So 3 being the value of A3, P2 was 2, P1 was 1. A3 is 3, Q2 is 3, we just computed that, and Q1 is 1, that was back here. So this works out to be 7 over 10. One more. 4 times 7 plus 2 over 4 times 10 plus 3 is 30 over 43. Technically we're done, we were just asked to compute them. And I just want to point out, it is not at all obvious what these are converging to. They have to be converging to something, and you can keep computing these out and make some guesses, I guess, or you could just plug it into, you know, uh, Wolfram Alpha and see what it tells you, but it is not at all obvious what this converges to. It is a very weird number. Uh, it's totally unintuitive, even though the partial quotients are pretty straightforward. AI equals I doesn't seem like it would be that complicated but it generates a convergence Pn over Qn that are converging to something very exotic and unexpected in my opinion.